welcome to the Jew 3 Project podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Fields. I'm the founder of the Jew 3 Project. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Jude 3 Project Podcast. Um, I'm joined with my co-host, Pastor Cameron Triggs. Cam, what's up? I'm doing good, Lisa. How are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got an exciting episode here on Jude 3 Podcast. Um, first and foremost, I just want to appreciate him and let him know that we are glad to have him as a guest. We have Pastor Sadidi. On your uh, wheelie. Did I say that right? Hey, very good, man. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pastor, we want to thank you so much for being here on the podcast for us. Um, just as a way of introduction for our audience who may not know you, could you introduce yourself? Uh, well, yep. Yeah, as, as you as you said so well, I'm Fabidi Anyabwile. Uh, I'm, I'm a pastor in Southeast Washington D.C. with Anacostia River Church, a uh, new church plant that we moved back to the states to help begin uh, last July. Prior to that, served for about eight years as senior pastor of First Baptist Church in Grand Cayman in the Cayman Islands, and uh, before that was here in D.C. again with uh, Capitol Hill Baptist Church. I uh, came to Christ around 1997 after several years as a practicing Muslim and then waffling between uh, agnosticism and atheism before the Lord saved me through the preaching of the gospel. Amen. Uh, amen. That's awesome. Pastor Tabi, before we get into uh, into the topic of Islam, I know part of your testimony is um, some exposure to the religion itself. Could you share that experience with us? Yeah, so uh, as a sophomore in undergraduate school, I came back for the, the new school year uh, after having spent my freshman year reading everything I could about Islam and, um, you know, was introduced to that topic broadly through uh, Malcolm X and the autobiography and uh, all the stuff that's been written on the nation. And so I had uh, this sort of interest and curiosity in Islam, and when I came back my sophomore year, uh, there were some men on campus, very clean cut, uh, with their suits and bow ties, talking about the need for black men to live uh, righteous and clean lives, to care for their families and their communities. Uh, long story short, this was some of the fruit of Islam. And um, I, I knew enough about the nation of Islam to know that it was it was cultic, that it wasn't Islam proper. Um, but that just that just gave me now accessibility to people. Uh, to feed my curiosity. And so, long story short, my sophomore year, I uh, converted to Sunni Islam and was a practicing Muslim through the rest of undergraduate school and a, a little bit thereafter um, and was was zealous for Islam and a real opponent of the cross. And um, and so, lived that way, as I said, through undergraduate years. So, after, um, led a number of men into Islam and, um, and, and until the Lord really one year during Ramadan, was up early for the fast and uh, was reading the Quran and had this this growing awareness. It dawned on me that what I was reading uh, was inconsistent and couldn't be true. It admitted too much about Jesus on the one hand and denied too much about him on the other hand. And that put me in a year of kind of searching for answers. And uh, the more I searched, the more half-truths and inconsistencies I found. And after that year, left Islam, and that's when I kind of bounced between agnosticism and atheism uh, before hearing the gospel preached clearly, and the Lord, by His Spirit, raising me from death to life. Amen. Wow. Amen. And praise God for that testimony. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to presuppose too much for our listeners, um, and I think you would do well um, considering your experience and your knowledge of study. Um, how would you summarize Islam or Islams, because I know there are different branches, um, how would you summarize that to a typical listener who hasn't been exposed uh, to a formal definition of Islam, what they believe and what they practice? Sure. Well, Islam is one of the three great uh, monotheistic religions. Uh, it's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, Islam is the baby of those religions, and uh, and yet it makes uh, great boast for itself. It, it understands itself to be the final and the seal of all religions, uh, so that they understand that the Prophet Muhammad, the only um, sort of prophet of Islam, uh, to be the greatest prophet and the last prophet 
um, that all the other prophets before him, including Jesus, whom they regard as a prophet, were prophets of Allah who brought uh, revelation from Allah and brought the same basic message, that is the duty of man um, to submit to the will of God. Um, and so you, you will sometimes hear Muslims who will say something like, you know, um, Judaism is the elementary school, Christianity is the high school, but Islam is the university because they regard, again, Islam as the, the perfect religion. And, and they would, most Muslims would think that Christianity is a corruption of Jesus' teaching um, and that the scriptures have been twisted, um, that Christ never taught himself to be the son of God, which would be the highest blasphemy in Islam called shirk. Um, and that at the end of days, Christ will return again, and he will testify against those uh, who claim that he was God. Um, and so the whole duty uh, in Islam, the whole duty of man is to submit to the will of Allah. Um, the, the holy book of, of, of Islam would be the Quran, the one miracle of the prophet Muhammad, uh, supposedly a miracle, uh, because though the prophet, according to tradition, was uh, unlearned, um, basically illiterate. Um, he, in a in a in a revelation from the angel Gabriel, was commanded to recite the the Quran, and uh, mm -hmm. and so did committed it to memory, and his later followers committed it to to writing. Um, one thing that might be helpful for people to know is I think oftentimes as Christians we tend to think that all religions have the same goal essentially. Um, mm -hmm. that all religions are somehow trying to answer the question of how it is you attain spiritual salvation. Uh, that, that's a mistake in our thinking. Not all religions have the same goal. Um, mm -hmm. so, so Islam's goal is, is Dar al-Islam, the house of Islam, to bring the entire world under the rule of Islam. It, it is not uh, primarily in, in the Christian sense um, to figure out how people are reconciled to God and, and how their sins are atoned for and how they're saved. It, it is rather submission. Um, and, and a sort of constitution for that goal is Sharia law, uh, to bring folks under the rule of Sharia so that um, every, every man would essentially be a, a Muslim line. Um, so when we talk about sort of engaging Muslims and talking with Muslims, particularly uh, Arab Muslims or Pakistani Muslims, um, then, then it's important to understand how they're thinking about the religion and how that differs from how that differs from Christianity. Now, the other thing I will say is, uh, like Christianity, I think uh, Islam. And you, you framed it in your question. The sort of various Islams. Um, Islam is not one thing, and it is it is a is a very diverse religion. Um, so most Muslims, like arguably most Christians, most Muslims are folk Muslims. Um, they're nominal Muslims. Uh, they're not. We tend to think of Arab Muslims and jihadists and so on. But the, the most populous Muslim country in the world is Indonesia, um, and so that'll, that'll give you a sense of the diversity uh, that's within Islam. Two two major two major uh, branches of Islam, if you will: Sunni Islam and uh, Shia Islam, and then there are a number of other kind of splinter groups and theological schools as well. Thank you for that. Uh, in your introduction, you mentioned uh, the nation of Islam, uh, and you uh, alluded that it is more occultic in nature, and some Orthodox um, Muslims would actually shun away from nation of Islam as an authentic form of the practice of the religion. But could you give us a, a definition of nation of Islam and what they believe and kind of how that evolved in the fact that um, America here, that type of uh, uh, system of belief? Yeah, well, most people will know the Nation of Islam by its uh, its, its famous spokespersons, uh, most famous of which would be Malcolm X. But um, today, uh, a disciple of Malcolm X, um, Minister Louis Farrakhan, um, rap groups like Public Enemy made the Nation of Islam, you know, quite popular in the eighties and nineties again. So it's in its kind of second um, revival, if you will. Uh, but it was founded in the middle part of the 1900s uh, by a man, uh, Warf Muhammad, um, Elijah, uh, who was a teacher of, uh, oh, excuse me, Farid Muhammad, who was a teacher of Elijah Muhammad. Um, according to the Nation of Islam, God came to earth in the form of, of Farid Muhammad. Um, he came as a, a very light-skinned black man. 
uh, to redeem the sort of lost peoples, uh, the original peoples, um, the Afro-Asiatic peoples, um, known now as, as African Americans or the black man. Uh, he taught um, he taught Elijah Muhammad the basics of, of Islam, and Elijah Muhammad, in some dubious circumstances, becomes um, the sort of leader of the nation of Islam after Farid Muhammad is arrested and, and uh, strangely disappears. Uh, it it is a mixture of uh, some Muslim teaching and a lot of black nationalist uh, political ideology. Um, it no no Muslim, no Orthodox Muslim would recognize the the sort of worldview of the Nation of Islam as Orthodox Islam. Um, so, just by one example, um, members of the Nation of Islam believe that the the races of men were created uh, by a mad scientist named Yakub, and Yakub essentially uh, diluted the the genetic uh, composition of the original black man. Kept grafting off uh, of the original black man the other um, races of people uh, until he made uh, essentially, uh, you know, the the white man, which is a, a, a blonde haired, blue eyed devil. Um, and and that the white man has wreaked havoc in the world um, since he left the caves of the Caucasus Mountains and um, and and is is to be resisted as a devil and so on and so no no, no Muslim just to use that as one example no no Muslim would understand that that's how God created humanity uh, or that there's some mad scientist uh, somewhere named Yakub who is a kind of demigod who created um, who created the races of men in that way. Why do you think Islam or the nation of Islam uh, specifically, I guess you could kind of answer to both streams of thought, why do you think they're so appealing to black Americans? Yeah, and, and particularly to uh, African American men and, and African American men particularly in the urban context. And I think um, this is part of my attraction to Islam. I think one part of it is um, with the nation of Islam and, and to some extent with Islam in general, you get this depiction of of a kind of strong manhood uh, of of a mm. of a strong masculinity and and when you're dealing with communities where there's been so much father pain and so much father absence um even if you can't name it as such oftentimes that's very attractive well mm. then you sort of combine that with th- this sort of picture of strong masculinity you combine that with a, a political ideology whether it's the politi- the black nationalist ideology of um, the nation of Islam, or, or whether it's a kind of anti-Western political ideology uh, of of uh, more orthodox forms of Islam, that becomes really attractive to a people who've been disenfranchised, marginalized, oppressed, enslaved, and so on. And so you get to be both religious uh, and political in in a very striking way. And and you know the other thing that was appealing to me, at least, and I think is appealing to some some others is you get this simple religious claim that there is one God um, and uh, he has no partners and the duty of man is to submit to the will of this one God. That's a very appealing, simple, intuitive claim compared to, say, the the Trinitarian theology of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And then you have a kind of discipline that goes along with that. You make prayer five times a day. You make Hajj to Mecca if you're able. You pay alms. Uh, or, or you give charitably two and a half percent of your income, you, you start to get these kind of legalistic rules that, that impose a discipline uh, on, on one's life. And, and that becomes that becomes pretty compelling for some people. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, how would you uh, suggest Christians build evangelistic relationships with Muslims? As a pastor, uh, you have members in your congregation, who are neighbors with Muslims, uh, how would you suggest they build those relationships that lend themselves to evangelism? Uh, thank you for that. You know, a couple years ago, I had the privilege of publishing with Moody Publishers a little book called The Gospel for Muslims. Um, and and it's, a, it's meant to be a, a kind of short primer on that, on that very question. And I think mm-hmm. the first thing to do is just to start where Romans 1.16 starts us, right? That the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. And our Muslim friends are, are Gentiles. 
Um, but what that text begs us to do is to have confidence in the gospel, that in the message of the gospel itself is God's power to save. Now, what that means is if, if we know and understand the gospel, then we know everything we need to know, really, for our Muslim neighbor or friend or co-worker um, to, to be saved from their sins and to be changed uh, and, and born again. Beyond that, uh, it's helpful if, if someone, you know, is schooled a little bit in apologetics, they know a little bit of the basics of Islam. Um, that's helpful for two things. One, just communicating some level of interest and respect to your Muslim neighbor or friend. They're not just your evangelistic project. You, you hopefully have a, a, an interest in them as a human being. But secondly, it's helpful in knowing um, sort of where your Muslim neighbor or friend might use the very same language that you use, but mean really mm-hmm. different things. Um, so, for example, uh, Muslims uh, have a conception of sin, but it's not quite what Christians mean by sin. And to the Muslim mind, a sin is more akin to a mistake or a failing or a fault, um, Muslims, Orthodox Muslims, don't believe any of the prophets of God uh, sinned. But in the Christian mind, you go, nope, everyone since Adam has been born in sin, with the exception of Christ. And it's that sin that that is not merely a, a fault or a mistake or what have you. It's that sin which is a cosmic rebellion against God that has made God angry. And it's that sin for which we either must give an account uh, or we must make atonement. Right. Uh, And so to 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 do the work of evangelism well, I think I think you have to be able to um, make some distinctions between what a Christian believes about certain things and what a Muslim believes and where sin is sin is um, in view specifically. I think it's really important that you don't move to the cross and you don't move to the gospel until you do what the Puritans used to call a, a good law work. Un- until you have emphasized the law and the holiness of God um, and our accountability to sin to such an extent that your Muslim neighbor is able to articulate biblically what sin is and more importantly uh, or as importantly is able to articulate that they understand that they are themselves sinners and therefore guilty before God. And when, you, when you reach that point, then you're able to move to Christ. If you, if you, if you move to Christ before that, then you just... You, in my experience, you're typically playing Bible ping pong um, and mm-hmm. kind of going back and forth on the nature of Christ or defending the crucifixion, uh, all of which is important, but uh, all of which becomes more effective if the person understands they have something personal at stake, namely namely their soul before a holy God. Mm-hmm. That's really good. I appreciate your practicality in answering that question to really help somebody think about how can I do this in a tangible manner? Mm-hmm. Instead of just building up arguments, but how can I actually not just make my neighbor a target, but you know, build a relationship <laughs> that uh, really yeah. lends itself for the gospel? Um, that, that's huge. I think that's very helpful. And, um, and, and, along, and along those lines, it's it, it's important to do some other things practically, like like practice mm-hmm. hospitality. Uh, right. So in, in the Muslim world, hospitality is huge. It's it's an important part of the culture. It's part of how you communicate respect for others and uh, how you communicate uh, a, a certain sense of, of love for others. Uh, and so it's to our shame, for example, that in the United States, um, w- with one of the most developed university systems in the world, we attract students from all over the world, including the Muslim world. And foreign students will come to universities here, undergraduate and graduate programs. They could be here from four to ten years and never be in an American home, much less a Christian home. Um, and so they, they leave the country, having been here sometimes a decade, and they don't know Americans. Uh, and not only Americans, they don't know Christians. Um, and so that's to our shame, particularly given the value, value that they place um, on, on hospitality. I'll never forget my first trip to the Middle East to engage in a, a Christian Muslim uh, dialogue. And uh, we were, uh, there, there were campus organizations that were hosting the dialogue. And I remember meeting with some of the Muslim students. And uh, one of the young men, the very first question he asked me after we just sort of uh, exchanged our names and greeted one another, very first question out of his mouth with, with some pride was, How do you find our hospitality? And I just thought, you know what? <laughs> he's he's thinking about this on another level of importance. 
than, than right. your average Westerner or Christian. And yet we're commanded in Romans to be hospitable. And so that, that's, there's another practical thing you can do. Invite your neighbor to your home for a meal or for tea or coffee. Make sure it's, make sure it's halal. Make sure you don't have any pork products or things like that you're serving. Uh, or invite, if you've got kids the same age as your kids and your kid plays baseball or soccer, invite them out to a, a game and just take in a game together. Uh, when they move into the neighborhood, uh, make sure they know where they go get their utilities connected or um, mm-hmm. where are good places to shop for this or that. Just be a good neighbor, and that creates a relational context uh, for having spiritual conversation. Yeah, and that also breaks down. Oh, go ahead. I said, and it also breaks down is the Islamophobia, too, because we mm-hmm. often have a, you know, so many Americans are, are scared of Muslims. And so um, having those relationships kind of tears down that wall and, you know, helps us build relationships. Um, and so it helps us to get to know Muslims, who they who they are, as, seeing them as people. Um, and so I think that's important. So thank you for that. Dr. Well, that's, that's a good word. We really have to renounce fear. Fear is the enemy of faith and, and fear will drain you of any loving evangelistic concern. And so it, it's probably good for Christians to turn off the television news and open up a copy of Operation World uh, or, or some other uh, Joshua Project, some other sort of uh, source of information about people groups and uh, to pray for them and to look for opportunities rather than just tuning into the news and the hysteria uh, that, that comes along uh, through the news reports. Amen. Pastor Tabini, can you touch on that Islamophobia? Because um, I, I would, wouldn't be surprised. Many Christians do have that issue. Uh, I want to witness to this person, but deep down in my heart, I'm not sure if they are a undercover uh, member of a militant uh, ISIS cult or something mm-hmm. to that extent. You know, a lot of people have those misnomers. They only get their... Um, theology or religions from Fox News or CNN, and they don't really have any <laughs> biblical perspective on that. How would you break down that barrier from a pastoral perspective? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think all of our stereotypes, not all of them, many of our stereotypes of of, of our Muslim neighbors and friends uh, really are fear based, and so we mm. fear one of two things usually that that paralyzes when it comes to evangelism. We fear that either the person has memorized the Quran and is, you know, uh, uh, a sort of zealot religiously for Islam. And and so, therefore, we're unable to sort of match them in our knowledge of the Bible or the knowledge of of Islam. Or we fear that they are they are jihadists, right, that they are Mm -hmm. in some sleeper cell and they're they're living among us until that day where they're awakened in their cell and they commit some terrorist act. And I just want to say um, a couple of things that encourage folks. Number one, our greatest apostle was a terrorist. Mm-hmm. The, apostle, the apostle Paul was a terrorist. He was on his way to uh, arrest Christians and imprison Christians. He stood by while Stephen was stoned to death for preaching the gospel. Um, he, he says of himself in uh, 1 Timothy 1 around verses 12 to 15 that he was a, a blasphemer, a persecutor, a, a violent man. But mm-hmm. God saved him. So even if your neighbor is a terrorist, the one thing that can change him from being a terrorist is the gospel. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so you, you don't win by, by shrinking back. And letting him continue mm-hmm. in a sleeper cell. So imagine the worst you can about you know your Muslim neighbor being a terrorist. And and the answer to that problem is actually Romans one sixteen, the power of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, so so your fear ought to be a motivation uh, for sharing the gospel. And and if 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 you fear, oh this guy knows more than I do, and it's probably got the Quran memorized again. Remember, most Muslims have not read their Qurans. They don't know their Qurans very well. Um, that most Muslims are folk Muslims. That's just a stereotype. And if they ask you a question that you don't know the answer to, let me give you the magic answer every time. I don't know, but I'll get it back to you. <laughs> That's all you have to say. I don't know. I'll get back to you. And that has two advantages. Number one, it's honest. So you're building the relationship on honesty. Number two, it keeps the conversation open when you say, I'll get back to you. 
You just create mm-hmm. the expectation that this is going to be a normal part of, of what we do as friends or neighbors or coworkers is we're going to, you know, get together from time to time. And so, um, you know, address your fear with the gospel um, mm-hmm. and, and address, address the gospel not only to your Muslim neighbor, but address it to yourself. Right. So mm-hmm. so if, if your Muslim neighbors are terrorists and, and if they threaten your life, guess what? Your life is hid with Christ, who sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Even if you die, the Lord says, yet you will live. Uh, you have already passed from death to life. Um, you, we risk nothing as Christians to engage our Muslim neighbors and friends, even, even in, in, on their home turf in the Middle East, in places where they are beheading Christians. We don't risk a thing. We get a great reward in the kingdom of heaven uh, if we give our lives in the cause of the gospel. Uh, that's the promise that the Lord makes uh, in Matthew 5 and many other places. And so uh, let's just renounce fear together and let's just lean into this with the gospel, knowing that the gospel is what will transform people. Yeah. Amen. And it really brings to mind that scripture, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, Amen. but of power, love, and a sound mind. And I think that uh, Paul is writing that to Timothy in a face of persecution, yep. uh, uh, fear of uh, pressure from people despising his youth, possibly, but he says that he should go forth in love, power, and sound mind that is rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I think that's a great encouragement to our listeners. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate that uh, response. To kind of just equip our listeners kind of with some compare and con- contrast tools, um, would you do a co- compare and contrast of the Quran and the Bible? Um, what's the differences there? Uh, what significant issues lie um, when you look at the Quran and you look at the Bible? Great question. Um, Muslims and Christians believe that um, their books, the Quran and the Bible, um, are are messages from Allah, are revelations from Allah. And in fact, Muslims believe that uh, the Torah, the books of Moses, first five books of the Bible, the Psalms of David, uh, and the Injil, or the Gospels, uh, are also revelations from God, but have been either misunderstood or distorted. So we, mm. we are both people of revealed religion, right? Mm. And and we both hold our, our should hold our scripture as authoritative um, for for life and faith. And so that we, we're talking together as believers uh, in mm. in God speaking into the world. Um, the the Bible is a is an altogether different kind of book, though. Uh, there are different um, uh, literary styles or genres in the Bible, from history to poetry and wisdom literature to um, sort of the biographies of the Gospels to prophecy uh, and apocalypse. Um, written by over forty authors over you know a sixteen hundred period, sixteen hundred year period, uh, three different languages, yet telling one unified story, um, mm-hmm. so that the Old Testament. Is are, are sort of promises made, God making promises to his people um, to supply a savior and a deliverer. Uh, the New Testament is promises kept. Um, God has sent Christ into the world and he keeps every promise. Every promise is yes and amen in Christ uh, for, for saving his people. So our, our book is one story. The Quran is not like that. The Quran has uh, surahs or chapters that are written in different periods of, um, or, or, or sort of taken from different periods of the Prophet Muhammad's life. So mm-hmm. there are some sections of the Quran that are, uh, most Muslims would say, are abrogated. Um, they, were, they were written before Muhammad came back into Mecca and successfully conquered Mecca, and Islam began to spread throughout uh, most, of the, most of the sort of Middle Eastern world and North African world. And then there are there are surahs that are written after that, which are thought to still be binding and in force. One of the other differences between the Quran and the Bible is that Christians believe that the Bible is sufficient in and of itself. But there's a great debate inside of Islam as to whether or not the Quran is sufficient. So most Muslims say you, you can't read the Quran and understand it well unless you do two things. Unless you read it in the Arabic. And unless you read it with the hadith, the tradition, these collections of, of sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad uh, mm-hmm. by, by followers uh, of the Prophet Muhammad. And those hadith are ordered, um, they're kutsi hadith or, or trustworthy hadith, 
And then there's some that are less trustworthy, less reliable. And so even there, you got to know kind of what you're reading. But most Muslims say you're going to need uh, both the Quran and the Hadith in order to understand the religion and how to practice the religion. Uh, so that's one of the ways in which it's different. Of course, the Bible centers on Jesus Christ. Um, it all points to him. He fulfills it all. He is uh, God has spoken to us in these last days by his son. Uh, and everything that was written before him really is pointing to him. And and the Quran sort of takes up the life of Muhammad and uh, his, his wars and struggles and battles. Uh, it does not center on salvation in Christ. Of course, it, it, it in many ways opposes that. Um, and so you're getting two really different messages in the two books when it comes to how it is we know God, what it is, what our duty is before God, uh, and specifically how we're to understand Jesus Christ. What are some good questions to ask when this debate arises? Because um, many times Christians are put on the defensive. Um, but what are some good offensive questions for a Christian to ask when the discussion between the Quran and the Bible arises? Yeah, I almost never ask offensive questions uh, about mm -hmm. the Quran, and that, and that's for two reasons. One, you're right. Many many of, of our Muslim neighbors and friends will either have questions or challenges about the Bible, and I don't mind that because that puts me on home turf, right? That 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 automatically mm -hmm. puts the conversation in the text of Scripture, and uh, that's where I want to be. And here's a little tip that I, I hope many folks will find useful. Often your Muslim friend will try to read the Bible the way he reads the Quran, meaning the Quran is sort of these collection of sayings, almost like the Proverbs in our Bible. But the mm -hmm. Bible's not like that. If you're reading from the letters, there's an argument being made. If you're reading in the histories, there's a timeline in history. You, you can't just sort of drop in, pick up a verse, and then sort of pluck it out of its context. And so usually what's really helpful is when you find someone trying to point out some error or some contradiction or to challenge something, it's really helpful to go four verses up and then read down to four verses after the text you're talking about. And when you're in the Gospels in the New Testament, almost always um, it's going to have the answer to your question in that context, uh, and mm -hmm. it's going to be pointing to the Gospel in some helpful way. So yeah, I you know, in, in my perspective... Though there's much you could say and do that would be offensive toward the Quran, I tend not to do it, number one, because it puts me on the home turf, which is the Bible. And number two, um, the, the, many Muslims have high respect for the Quran. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes you, you wind up not having a fruitful conversation if they feel like you're disrespecting Islam or, or the Quran. And so I don't even mm -hmm. worry about risking that. I just, I just deal with the Bible. Another folks, uh, folks contention. Yes, I was going to say if folks are interested in thinking more about the Quran uh, mm -hmm. and thinking about it critically and really helpfully, I can't think of a, a better resource than uh, James White's uh, book, "What Every Christian Should Know About the Quran." I had the privilege of reading that and and blurbing that. It it is easily the best treatment uh, on the Quran that that I have read from an evangelical Christian perspective, and there'll, mm -hmm. there'll be more than enough information in there to help someone become uh, conversant with the Quran. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, another big component that you don't want to disrespect is Muhammad. Um, mm -hmm. Very, uh, very uh, held in high esteem by a lot in the Islam religion. But could you do a compare and contrast of Muhammad and Jesus? What differences? lie there. Um, Islam understanding of Muhammad and Jesus, and then a, a Christian understanding of Muhammad and Jesus. Yeah, great question. Uh, a Muslim understanding of, of Muhammad and Jesus would be that they are both prophets, uh, both sent to their people uh, with a message from, from, from God, and that message is Islam. So Jesus was sent to Jewish people as a Jewish prophet, uh, calling them to the ways of Islam, and Muhammad was sent to Arab peoples um, as an Arab prophet, but also the sort of final prophet um, with the message of Islam. Uh, most Muslims would believe that Jesus did miracles and did far more miracles, uh, many more miracles than, than Muhammad, uh, and yet, again, would, would hold that Jesus' followers corrupted the message. Um, they would understand that um, Jesus, um, there's scenes in the Quran where Jesus is said to be um, 
deferring to Muhammad, pointing forward to Muhammad, and things of that sort. So again, they would understand Muhammad to be greater. They would understand both men to merely be men, um, though, though prophets. But of course, in Christianity, we, we deny that Muhammad is a prophet at all. Uh, we, thinking about Hebrews chapter 1, would understand that uh, in former times, God spoke to us in various ways through many prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. And we continue there in Hebrews, we are reminded that the son is the exact radiance of God's glory, is exact representation of, of God's being. Um, so not only is Jesus fully man, but he's also fully God. He's God the son. And, and, and has been God the Son from all eternity past and will be to all eternity future. And we would understand that he brought a message, but it's not the message of Islam, it's the message of the gospel, um, that, that God is uh, creator of all, and therefore he owns all, and, and all are meant to worship and obey him, um, that he is holy and just and, and will not suffer our sins to go uh, unpunished. And man, in his sin and rebellion, has earned the wrath of God. And there's only one way to be reconciled to God, and that's through the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, on the cross of Calvary, where he endured God's wrath on our behalf uh, and in our place, where he died and three days later was raised again from the grave for our justification, so that God now calls all men everywhere to repent of their sins and to trust in Christ. Uh, that's the heart of biblical religion. That's the heart of Christianity. That's what even the Jewish scriptures are pointing to, and then the New Testament scriptures tells us is fulfilled in Christ. And so we would we would understand um, who Jesus is in radically different ways. Amen. I think people are going to definitely be helped and enriched by this um, interview. Uh, what what is the last word you want to leave with our listeners, and what resources? Um, would you recommend besides the one you've already um, discussed? I know you mentioned your book and also um, Dr. James White's book, but um, in your closing, just if you have any other resources or, and your social media, ways people can get in contact with you. Sure. If, if I had a final exhortation, it would be to trust in the gospel, believe the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation. Uh, meditate deeply on the gospel and you'll find yourself prepared to talk about Christ. Um, very fluently with your Muslim neighbor or friend. If, if you're a Christian and believe the gospel, you already know everything you need to know uh, in order to see your, your Muslim neighbor friend come to faith in Christ. Um, other resources, one very short little book that people might find helpful uh, is called The Christian's Pocket Guide to Islam. Uh, just a very simple, short little primer to Islam for someone who may be brand new um, to this to this issue. Uh, and then also, I've had the privilege for the last 10 years, every other year, uh, going to the Middle East and engaging in Christian-Muslim dialogues. Uh, and most of those are available on YouTube, or if you go to ChristianMuslimDialogue.org, um, you can watch those debates with men like Shabir Ali and Bassam Zawadi uh, and so on. And, and I hope that would be of, ins of some encouragement. Uh, otherwise, people can find me at the front porch, thefrontporch.org. Or at my other blog, Pure Church, uh, and I would I would love to hear from folks. Thank you so much. This has been an awesome time. Oh, it was a joy to be with you guys, man. I pray the Lord would continue to bless the Jew Three Project and to bless you guys and your labors uh, there in your churches as well. Amen. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Jew 3 Project podcast. You can catch all our past episodes at wwwjew 3 projectcom backslash podcast. You can follow us on iTunes by searching Jew 3 Project. Also, you can follow us on Twitter at Jew 3 Project, on Instagram at Jew 3 Project, and on Facebook at facebook.com. Um, backslash Jude 3 project and remember you can donate on our site so if this um, this podcast and this ministry is a blessing to you help support us financially um, by going on our website at Jude3project.com and hitting the donate tab um, and donating consider donating to us thank you so much remember at the Jude 3 project we're helping you to know what you believe and why you believe it